Hi, welcome everyone to the next edition of On the Park Bench. I want to welcome you all here today. This is brought to you by the Congress of the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and our allied organizations. And it's an opportunity to, for audience to engage in real time. We feel that in this era of social distancing, um, more than ever, we needed to provide a platform for members to discuss, engage on emerging issues. Um, today, we will be talking about uh, when the public realm is all you have, COVID and homelessness. All right, we're going to be hearing today from, let me get my paperwork straight, Steve Coe, who has dedicated his career to advancing the rights of people with mental health concerns. As the CEO of a New York City nonprofit, Community Access, he has created many innovative programs. We're also going to hear from Carol Carbayou. Uh, she's the Vice President of Behavioral Health Services at the Thriving Mind in South Florida. She oversees nationally recognized initiatives that have led to a drastic reduction in incarceration for people with behavioral health issues and the advancement of collaborative ventures to reduce street homelessness. Elena Madison, Vice President from the Project for Public Spaces, a longtime partner of CNUs, will also be joining us. She's an urban planner with rich experience in the planning design of parks, plazas, campuses, and the public spaces of civic and cultural institutions. Julie Orlando is the Deputy Health and Human Services Center, Deputy of Health and Human Services Center at the Housing Authority of Bergen County, New Jersey. And in 2015, Julia assumed leadership of Bergen County's strategic plan to end veteran homelessness, a goal achieved in 2016. That's amazing. And then finally, we're gonna hear from Rokas Lupik, who's the principal of International Learning Experiences in the Netherlands. Um, I wanna remind everyone to go ahead and ask, uh, ask your questions through the Q&A button, which is down at the bottom. Each panelist will speak for about seven or eight minutes and we're gonna open up for Q&A as soon as we can. As a reminder, the recording of this, as well as the PowerPoint, will be available um, about 24 hours after we air. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, so is the presentation going up? There we go. So next slide. Here are our speakers today. So when we're looking, the, the issue here um, we were asked to talk about was homelessness, especially homelessness in, a, in, public, in public spaces. And for planners um, who are maybe used to working in the physical realm, um, when planning for social policy, um, the same rules apply, but it's um, the, the strategies and, and the presenters I've put together today each represent, um, I think, um, examples of uh, of implementing these planning rules in a in a unique and a successful way. And and one of the issues, uh, first of all, is just defining and solving the right problem. Often, when um, uh, the, you have people gathering in public spaces, the first reaction is to how do you get the people out of the public space? There's aggressive architecture. There's making the benches uncomfortable. There's putting up fences. There's you know, uh, law enforcement to move people out of parks and move them to another part of the, the city. Um, and what we're advocating for is that there's a, um, a, a problem that people are really facing uh, homeless challenges and they're facing housing challenges and engagement and, can, and beginning a process from street living back to indoor living is complex and it's time consuming and it requires a lot of partnerships and collaboration to, to, to get it right. And we're advocating, I'll stay on that slide for a second, um, that this get out of the building um, is going out and, and finding out what works, talking to people. And it also in the brainstorming side is bringing people in who are subject experts. And a lot of subject experts are people who've been homeless or are currently homeless, 
have been arrested, have been in jail, have been incarcerated, have been in shelters. They have a lot to say about what um, helps and what doesn't help. Also, you will find people gravitate towards libraries and the McDonald's and so forth. They're going to those places because they provide something that, um, that they need. And so how do you then replicate those services and supports and attract people um, to the engagement process? And finally, um, uh, as you're planning and then implementing, things never go right and they have, you have to be flexible and you have to change. And in government, it's so hard to do that. Most of these plans get developed, put out, there's an RFP, people respond, and then you see what government wants you to do and you say, this doesn't make any sense. I wish they had talked to me before they designed this whole solution because um, you know I can't hire the right staff, these salaries are wrong and, and so on and so forth. And finally, um, whatever you're doing, you measure results. And if it's not working, stop doing it and, and do something else um, and being able to pivot. These are things that happen in business all the time, um, but they rarely happen in social policy and, and in government. And one of the books I'm recommending people read is uh, Lean Impact, which is a social policy framework using those, those tools. So these are just some of the barriers in terms of people that um, don't have homes, um, having enough, you know, having an income, having the skills to manage a, a whole process to, to find housing. Um, if you've been on living in a cardboard box to then become uh, able to then live in an apartment, there's a, there's a big uh, learning curve and a readjustment curve that has to happen. And people often come with barriers that, that they were born with, They're the color of their skin, or there were uh, uh, maybe three generations of people um, in, a, in a criminal justice system, um, and then all the trauma related to, to, to those lifestyles. Next. So the model we're going to be talking about that, that a lot of successful programs is called Housing First, developed by a guy named Samson Barris, who I've known for many over 30 years. And this little chart says that, you know, that the, the uh, sort of standard model was you get people ready for housing. And then once they're ready, then they, then they can, um, you know, then they can, you move people into housing. And the Housing First model says, you know, you can move up people into housing much quicker than that and then address those needs. So you don't have to become clean for six months or you don't have to have, you know, certain, maybe certain other uh, milestones reached that you can do a lot with support services after you get somebody into housing. But my next slide, there needs to be some transition period and there's an engagement process that has to take place to change people's identity about themselves about if you've been living outside, you consider yourself an outdoor liver. Um, and these programs that we're gonna be talking about um, have made that um, engagement process uh, possible. Next slide. Um, another key feature that I wanna stress is including people who have lived this life as part of the solution. Um, Many states licensed peer specialists have training programs. Community Access runs a, a, a 200 or 300 hour training program. People who have these experiences of homelessness and mental health care have a unique skill set that can be used to help other people. And um, there are peer run and peer informed organizations all over the place. Um, and as a planner, as you're getting out of the building and going out to seeing what works and finding subject experts, there are people out there who will be happy to, to talk to you. Um, how are you gonna pay for all this? Doing nothing is very, very expensive. And um, great article about, uh, called Million Dollar Murray about a fellow that cycled through uh, Reno, Nevada's uh, social uh, service system and jail system for years and years. Um, and um, Malcolm Gladwell, there are many, many articles and, and, artic and uh, uh, blogs and so forth looking at the concepts that uh, Malcolm introduced into that article. Um, and I encourage people to, uh, to, to think about that. And as we talk about, we're going to be talking about Miami Beach and Miami programs have started with no funding. And because of the success of the programs and the savings that they were shown to uh, accumulate, they actually gathered more support to expand what they were doing. 
And I'm gonna pass this on to Carol in Miami. Uh, thank you, Steve. So good morning, everybody. My name is Carol Caravaggio and I am the Vice President at Thriving Mind South Florida. Um, here on the screen, you're gonna see an illustration of you know, the size of Miami-Dade County versus the size of um, the Miami Beach area, which is the area that I'm going to be focusing on on this project that it's called Team Up, and it's a collaboration between Thriving Mind South Florida, who's a behavioral health organization. We oversee contracted providers that provide those services and the Miami Beach Police Department. So to give you a little bit of history, um, back in 2000, Judge Stephen Leifman, who's a national um, speaker, um, created the Criminal Mental Health Project. And he wanted to divert nonviolent misdemeanor defendants that have behavioral health disorders from the jail system and then place them into community treatment and um, services. So as he progressed his criminal mental health project, he then um, began working through the crisis intervention team and he developed the first um, CIT um, teams and process in Miami-Dade County and he hired a crisis um, intervention team coordinator to be able to train law enforcement on how to respond effectively to those individuals that have a behavioral health condition. Um, so now Miami-Dade County has probably about 7,000 CIT trained officers that are better equipped to deal with individuals that are suffering from, from a behavioral health condition. Um, fast forward to 2015, the Miami Beach Police Department um, created this homeless outreach program that I'm gonna to talk to you about. And this year we're hoping to actually open up a um, diversion center where individuals that are criminally justice involved are be able to get all their services in a one-stop shop location. Next. So when you think of Miami Beach, this is what usually um, comes to mind. People think about the glitz and the glamour and the nightlife of Miami Beach, you know, the coastline um, and Ocean Drive. However, go to next. What do you think about this? Um, this is actually within the mangroves. If you've ever been to Miami Beach, in order to get to the beach, you have to go over the dunes and there's mangroves on, the, on various sides. So this is what you'll find in those mangroves if you look closely enough. Next, what about this? This is on Washington Avenue, which is one of the busiest streets on Miami Beach. It's where all the restaurants and all the nightlife happens um, and on Lincoln Road. And this is um, some of the homeless individuals that you know, frequent there and that you know, live in that area. So back in 2016, we received a phone call from the Miami Beach Department who wanted to do something about their homeless situation they realized that they were not gonna arrest their way out of homelessness. They heard about the Marchman Act, which is a court order that helps somebody get placed into treatment involuntarily. And they wanted to see if they can pursue this, this law, this method to help some of their individuals that are chronically dying on the streets. So this is actually a picture of the Thriving Mind staff and the Miami Beach officers during our first planning meetings. So in order to help these individuals, the Miami Beach officers created this criteria as to who they were gonna do um, outreach for. They decided they were going to work with those individuals that did not have a support system in the community, no family members to speak of, that are chronically homeless and that were literally dying on the streets of Miami Beach because they could not appreciate their need for services. Um, these individuals are an extreme strain on public safety. There are multiple calls to um, police, fire rescue, and code enforcement because they're occupying you know, buildings or structures that they're not supposed to be in. And they have a long history of involuntary treatment um, and arrest. So I'm gonna give you one of our case examples. Um, this is Pedro, and I realized that this slide might be a little bit difficult um, to look at, but Pedro was one of our first participants in our team up project. Um, one morning, Officer Lantigua came across Pedro in this state. He thought Pedro, um, you know, was dead. You know, and by looking at this picture, um, he almost looked it. We learned that Pedro, in the last four days prior to this, had been drinking nothing but vodka and had not consumed anything else. Um, after doing like a sternum rub, they realized that Pedro was breathing. Fire rescue came out, and then he was transported to uh, an ICU unit where he stayed for three months. Um, the officers kept following up and they kept being told, don't call here again, Pedro's gonna pass away. Pedro did not, um, and he moved on to be one of our first participants. Here you'll see um, Pedro's history of arrest with the officers. We received Pedro's case, you'll see the timeline here in August of 2016. 
And then shortly thereafter, that's when he was admitted to ICU where he was there for almost uh, two and a half months. He was placed on a residential wait list to receive substance abuse treatment. And on November 22nd, right around Thanksgiving, we were able to place him in one of our shelter beds and shortly after place him in residential treatment where he stayed for about five months being fully compliant and receiving the services that he need. In July 4th, we were able to link him to housing services through our COC, um, you know, through the care that he received at the, at the facilities, and he was able to move into his apartment. Unfortunately, in January of the next year, he fell, he um, had a broken hip, ended up in the hospital. Um, individuals broke into his apartment, they vandalized it, he was evicted, and when they discharged him from the hospital, they didn't call us back and tell us Pedro was ready, and he ended up back on the streets, um, which is something, unfortunately, that happens um, all the time, even though you try to coordinate as best as possible. However, um, with the help of the officers, we continue to work on this, and in May of 2018, Pedro was able to receive a new apartment, and he moved back in, and he has remained there ever since. You can go to the next one. This is a picture of Pedro on the left where you see him with his officer, Officer Lantigua. He's the officer that had found him almost deceased on, the side, on that sidewalk. Um, and the officers do go out and continue doing engagement um, in the treatment facility. So this is the officer following up with him while he's in treatment. Um, and they do have a peer specialist also that works with this team who had been homeless in the past, substance abuse history, and had actually been arrested by these officers himself. Um, on the right, you see Pedro in his own apartment. You can see the difference in the pictures. Um, and that's him with one of our staff um, doing a follow-up care visit. Next. So I'm not gonna go through this chart. Um, this is a visual of what our process looks like. It starts all the way on the top left where an individual is identified. And ideally we put them through detox, through services, we link them to social supports, um, social security benefits, housing, and then we link them into housing. That's the the easy way of going about it. Um, it's never that easy. We um, Housing is not readily available for us. Um, Miami-Dade County, as you can imagine, is a pretty expensive place to live and uh, social security checks sometimes doesn't really, um, you know, cover any kind of rent or utility. So we do have to rely on various partners in getting this done. So recovery is not a linear process. It looks um, something like this. Next. This is a summary of some of the services that were delivered to Pedro and to all of our participants. We've had about 35 or so that have come through our, um, our program since. So you have a, a long list of those. We use best practices and care coordination. We want to make sure that everybody's involved and really can coordinate the services for these individuals. We do housing. We have peer services. Um, SOAR is a, a evidence-based practice to apply for Social Security benefits in an expedited manner. And we link them to employment services. And then here are some of the collaborations of the different agencies that really have helped us bring this um, program um, forth. Next. So going through, actually, Elena, could you, one more slide. I'm going to skip this one for now. Thank you. So I wanted to show very um, briefly what our pre-enrollment costs are to these individuals. So keeping seven individuals homeless on the streets, not doing services, business as usual, is a total of about $450,000. And this includes incarceration costs for those seven individuals, arrest costs, and various um, hospitalization costs. The $304,000 that you see on there, that's just Pedro's ICU stay. On here, we don't have fire rescue costs, so obviously this would be a lot more. Anybody that's ever taken an ambulance ride knows how expensive that is. So clearly I'm missing some of the information, but this is what I could you know, really get that was uh, you know, very clear. Uh, next, um, these are the post-enrollment costs. So this is once we've received these individuals into our program, this is what it costs for us to put them in services and get them housed. So you'll see some crisis um, detox services on here, treatment services, and that means putting them in residential treatment and providing them all of that care that comes with that, case management, psychiatric medication, um, supportive employment. We have some funds that are available to us to help individuals with housing assistance, so you'll see those um, in there. And we had two individuals that were in contempt of their March Act petition and were incarcerated for a total of 260 days, but it wasn't because they committed a crime. It was because they did not follow through with their March Act, which is their involuntary petition for treatment. So if you add all that up, it's $228,522. Next. Actually, go two back to the 
one, there you go. So this is the cost summary. Um, the total cost savings, if you, you know, look at how much it costs to, to save, to keep somebody on the streets, no services is 450,000. If you enroll them in services and you provide them um, all of the care that they need to 28, which actually gave us a cost savings, for these seven individuals for $221,000. Thank you. Um, these are some of the challenges and um, some of the resolutions that we had when we were implementing these um, programs. Um, we realized you know, very early on that the use of peers is essential. Um, they're able to speak the language of these individuals and they're able, um, able to relate to them on that level of, you know, of their experiences that they've had. Um, the police officers a visit to treatment and continued engagement and support is also key. Um, it allows for our participants to feel um, valued and you know supported by these officers that are trying to help them. Um, we know that we have to make sure that we engage them in various activities during the day to keep them in their treatment. Um, and we have constant um, meetings with all of the team members to make sure that we're continuing to be um, providing the services and coordinating the care. Next. These are just some of our outcomes very quickly. Um, so one year prior to enrollment, those seven individuals accounted for 403 days in jail because of a, a civil or criminal infraction. And however, the same seven never went back to jail except on the contempt of the Marchman Act. So there wasn't any new crimes. Um, we talked about the cost savings of about $221,000. Um, we've had individuals that have graduated from our program some have moved on to permanent supportive housing, some have gone into assisted living facilities. We've actually been able to help um, transition some individuals to um, other places in, in the country because they've had family members that they had been estranged um, from. So, um, and one of the main things that I wanna say is that housing is healthcare. Without us being able to move these individuals into housing and to continue to provide the services with them, I don't think that we would be um, where we are today. Next. And then the last slide is just some of the partners that are in this um, program. We could not do this in a vacuum by ourselves. And we're blessed to have the support of, you know, community organizations, the police department and various hospitals and our um, continued care organization, which is the Miami-Dade County Homeless Trust. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Elena. So thank you all. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, so I think I'm actually the only planning professional on this panel, which is actually very exciting to me to be joining um, uh, my colleagues who are working in um, social services, who are actually addressing homelessness um, through their careers. It, it's really exciting to see this. Um, my name is Elena Madison. I'm a vice president at Project for Public Spaces. Um, and I've been working as a planner in public space for probably close to 20 years at this point. But in the last, I would say, five to 10 years, we focused, I've, I have focused personally a lot on social inclusion in public space. Um, and that's why we at uh, Project for Public Spaces talk about placemaking for social inclusion. And we have been um, working and exploring with other partners around the country, how can we help our partners on the ground address issues of homelessness and mental health in public spaces. So um, most of what I'm gonna be talking to you about is our experience in Woodruff Park in Atlanta, where we began uh, a partnership with um, the organization Central Atlanta Progress and the Atlanta um, Downtown um, Improvement District on um, imp making some improvements to Woodruff Park. Uh, we began the engagement in 2016. We had a corporate sponsor, so we were able to uh, provide technical assistance, work with the park team, but also actually bring some funding to make physical improvements to the park. So. Um, Woodruff Park, right in the center of downtown Atlanta, and, um, you know, a park that had a very substantial audience of what we would call uh, regular users. 
So folks who um, may be experiencing homelessness or folks who may be sheltered or in programs, but spent most of their day in the park. Um, so scenes like the one you see on the photo, very common. Um, and in those kind of circumstances, for most people, this is not a good look. It's something that people are not used to seeing in public space. Um, and when we surveyed the users of Woodruff Park, um, all of them, um, you can see um, kind of the word cloud that popped up. So this was in 2016. There were a lot of good things about Woodruff Park and everybody, including the people who may have been perceived as experiencing homelessness, talked about visible homelessness. So it was clearly an issue. And uh, um, the park team took different approaches to addressing the issue. And one of the things that we see very often, and this is not uh, pointing a finger at Atlanta, many cities do that when they feel an area, a public area um, is becoming kind of a hotspot or a problem area, and they don't feel that they can um, control behaviors, they just close it down. So that was very common. Um, what we believe and what we've seen in practice is that we are, as planners and designers, we're actually underutilizing the role that public spaces have as this common nexus and common ground. So we are not using it effectively to reach out to the people who are already there and to make connections, human connections. So the photo you see on the screen um, is actually from a public space in Mexico City where we also worked under the same uh, program supported by Southwest Airlines. And um, we made improvements to a public space, but after the um, terrible earthquakes that just shook the city and destroyed so many people's lives a few years ago, that public space became uh, the natural focus of uh, mutual aid and people actually self-organized, brought supplies, they camped in the public space, they shared food, um, they shared resources and became kind of the place where the most vulnerable people in the community um, say, saved themselves, helped each other and everybody in the community helped them. And we know that public spaces have that potential because they are the places where we can grow trust and connect to each other. One of the things we've seen um, through this work in public space and, experience, and folks experiencing homelessness is they need to trust the people who reach out to them. So they may know the social workers or um, in the story of Miami, uh, Pedro knew this police officer and that's why they trusted them. And we think, and we see this over and over that public spaces are really a great place to build that trust and grow that trust. And um, the stories about going to the McDonald's or the coffee shop that's gonna uh, give you a free cup of coffee or let you use the bathroom, all these are acts of trust and these people are trust agents. So we know that in public spaces, we can grow these trust agents. And what we did in um, Atlanta with Woodward Park, what we recommended was um, you, creating this game area in the space that was perceived as kind of a hot spot and a problematic area. We custom designed and built this game card that contained all of the games. And you can see the area is um, used um, fairly well. Uh, it's pretty busy. And some of the people using that area are part of this usual um, typical user um, audience and some are students, downtown residents, downtown workers who are also interested in games. So we use it to kind of organize the activity. But most importantly, we use the game cart attendant to start building those relationships and start knowing the people who are in the park. So uh, the man you see in the photo is actually a student of social work from the university. So the university staffs the cart with a social work trainee essentially that helps um, kind of coordinate and, and create this trust and start, start building trust in the area. Um, and the other big 
change that happened and well two big things happened in Woodruff Park after um, this initial installation of the game cart and starting to engage people in a more um, consistent and thoughtful way. Uh, the first thing is we recommended that they hire a park manager. The park didn't have its own ma manager and that we feel is crucial for building those contacts and understanding who is there. So they hired a park manager and then um, a couple of years later in 2018, Southwest Airlines actually supported um, the park and uh, Central Atlanta with another grant that allowed um, Central Atlanta Progress to build a partnership with Hope Atlanta and hire a social worker whose main area of work is Woodruff Park. So this is Janika Robinson. Uh, she has been working in the park, I believe, for um, over a year now and has had um, since September 2018. So at this point, um, I think those numbers are from the end of December and has had a tremendous success uh, knowing um, the, the people who spend a lot of time in the park. Um, she was the one who told us that um, many of the people who spend their day in the park are not homeless. Um, they just don't have a place to spend the day or need other kinds of services. So um, I'm not gonna go in too much detail into uh, what she has been able to achieve, uh, but you can see very quickly, she's been able to engage with many, many people. She's made a tremendous number of referrals, um, enrolled many, many people in available programming, shelter placements, um, and over 100 people have been placed in permanent housing. And these are some of her clients um, who, because of the connection that happened in the park, uh, were able to receive services, be placed um, in permanent housing, and continue on with their lives. Uh, one thing I want to say, and Steve was the one who pointed that, that out, Hope Atlanta was not the only organization offering services. This was a major partnership with over 30 organizations in the city of Atlanta to uh, make all of this happen. A quick note on what is happening today with COVID and the stay at home order. Um, the folks who spend their time in the park, uh, many of them have nowhere else to go. So they are still in the park in not such high numbers, but they're still there. Um, Janika is still going, um, I think several times a week in the park to connect with them and contact them. And one of the big um, efforts on the part of uh, Ainsley Whipple, who is the park manager, has been to keep the restroom open while uh, assuring that um, you know the restrooms are being sanitized and uh, properly cared for to um, allow for people to use them. And another, I'm, I'm going to end on this note. Um, this is. Uh, an, a new initiative in downtown Atlanta uh, by, um, I guess, a, a famous hip hop artist. Uh, I'm not that hip on the hip hop, so I don't know this artist, but he partnered with another organization to um, install hand washing station throughout downtown Atlanta. So we're very um, interested and hopeful to see um, the work that's been happening in this real partnership, intentional partnership between organizations that are managing downtown spaces and the organizations that actually provide the social services and connect with people in the public spaces. So with that, I'm gonna pass um, this um, screen over to Julia and she will tell us about her experience in Bergen County. I'm gonna put my timer on because uh, I talk a lot. Um, so hi everyone. I am absolutely thrilled to be part of this amazing lineup, um, especially because of the success we've had in our program. Uh, we not only were the first in New Jersey to end veteran homelessness, 28th in the nation, but we were the first community to end chronic homelessness in the United States. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. And if you look at this map, you can see my office and Steve's office, and in between us is the biggest concentration of COVID in the United States. So we are literally in the hotbed of that. 
And because of that, in my opinion, um, never has there been a time that the need to end unsheltered homelessness been so great as right now. So this is our uh, timeline. Um, in 2002, uh, we did an analysis of our existing program and basically said, could we be doing this better? Um, and what really came out of this uh, with the uh, requirement through HUD was to develop a 10-year plan. So in this 10-year plan um, was determined that we needed to change the way we were delivering services, especially to our chronically homeless population. So in 2007, um, the County of Bergen collaborated with uh, Bergen County United Way and developed what's called Housing Works to demonstrate a public-private effort to implement, as Steve uh, spoke about, this housing first model. Um, and Tom Toronto, who still is the head of the United Way today, was appointed to head off that, um, that initiative. And in 2007, HUD aligned uh, the funding with the county funding and the building plan was revised to promote this one-stop center to integrate services. And why that's so important is because we are a suburban environment. Bergen County is 1 million people right outside of New York City. And because it's a suburb environment, we needed to make sure that all of the services were able to be accessed for people experiencing homelessness. And in 2009, um, the construction of this 27,000 square foot building was completed, which includes uh, housing, health, and social services. Uh, we do 73,000 meals to the public uh, every year from this facility. We also have uh, healthcare on site, we have a nurse on site, access to all of the social services, but the most important is uh, the access to housing. That is our primary focus. Next slide, please. So in the transformation process, the most important thing about our model is that this is political will. It was the County of Bergen, the leadership, the governmental leadership that was committed to ending homelessness. And what you can see then is if the government is invested in ending homelessness, you know, guess what? You're gonna end homelessness. There's absolutely no way to do this without that political will. So drafting that 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness um, and then having agency engagement. There were 200 uh, agencies, individuals interviewed in this process who are now committed to this process to provide services and support to this new plan. And also the restructuring of local funding to support the new system. So basically, if you were an agency that wasn't on board with Housing First, you know, guess what? You weren't gonna be part of this initiative. You weren't gonna get the same funding. The county really got on board with, with Housing First. And this is going back over 10 years ago, uh, which uh, it was very controversial, but it's amazing to see that we had that governmental support. And then having the technical assistance and the support for program excellence. Next slide, please. So in our continuum of care, we have 32 providers from our collaborative foundation who coordinate um, and provide prevention assistance for people. Um, we're looking at the precariously housed, the at risk of homelessness, people who are street homeless, and also people who needed that support in permanent housing. Next slide. This is our old system versus our new system. And you can see that in our old system, you know, we only had eight beds for women in a county of a million people. Um, the, the programs were dilapidated, they were temporary. Now you have this new one-stop one facility. It's welcoming, it's clean, people wanna go there, it's low barrier, it's open 24 hours a day. And let me tell you, in the middle of a pandemic, if you don't have a place, as Elena just talked about, for people to go during the day, how are you assisting them? They need places to go to get services. It's incredibly important. And then prioritizing and making sure that housing is at the forefront of your service delivery. Next slide, please. So here's our beautiful facility. It's 90 shelter beds. We have a drop-in program every day, twice a day on site. We do meals not only to the homeless, but also to the working poor, to anybody who needs them. We have showers on site, laundry storage. We have our nurses on site. And very important, we have those flexible office spaces on the property that people don't have to pay for it, that are fully functional so that all of those service agencies can come in and provide services. And like Carol talked about, 
you need all of those providers because some of the most important people that helped us were people that weren't even professionals. They were people that knew homeless individuals and the homeless individual trusted them and brought them for service. Next slide, please. This is uh, just a, on the left is a, what our shelter looks like. It's minimal, but it's clean and it's safe. There's no bugs. There's no, um, you know, there's enough space and distance for people to feel safe. Next slide, please. Uh, most importantly, we have a culture of collaboration. We have our housing specialists on site, the Board of Social Services on site, our nurses. We have uh, vocational services on site and that community-wide participation. Over 300 congregations work together to provide a meal. Not only do they make the meal, but they serve the meal in the facility so they're interfacing with people experiencing homeless, which reduces stigma. Next slide, please. So this is uh, something I do every year. I post this in the winter so we don't get lazy and we keep working on numbers. This is some of our outcomes. Our average length of stay is 60 days. We've housed over actually 1,500 people now. Uh, we've reached functional zero. We're one of the few communities in the nation, uh, only two that are called double zero for veterans and for chronic homelessness. Next slide. Uh, this is me and Rokas. That was awesome. Steve brought him to visit me. And look at me, my time is up. Last slide, I think. That's me, Wonder Woman. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna give it right back to Steve. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so I've been to Julia's program four times since last September. I keep bringing people out there. Uh, I'm so impressed by what she does. So I was a CEO of Community Access for 40 years. Um, uh, and over that time, I started, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, as a graduate student, actually as an urban studies student uh, at the new school, and we did a project on um, homelessness uh, for people who had been former psychiatric patients were getting evicted from hotels and winding up in the streets. And there were different programs that had merged throughout, throughout the city. And one was on the Lower East Side, where a group of people actually bought two tenement buildings on Stanton Street. And I walked into the building and um, with a group of students. And I, I came back uh, a few months later and asked to be a, uh, do my summer internship there and help um, maybe fix the buildings up was my, my concept. My grandfathers were carpenters and I thought that would be uh, something I could uh, contribute. So I never left. Um, and during the 80s and 90s, we, we, we started renting apartments for people. We lost our buildings. Um, and, and by 1993, it became clear to me when I was, uh, starting and I knew this know nothing student, I would talk to the tenants about what they needed and what would help and what would be a good idea. And we had become very professional by 1993 with social workers and cl clinicians and so forth. And I thought we had lost the culture of learning from the people we were trying to help. And I hired a national advocate, a fellow named Howie the Harp, and there's a link to his uh, video about who he was and really to transform the organization, the culture of the organization, so that the people working for us would actually have an a, a intimate understanding of, of the needs of people we were, we were helping. Um, how he died, fortunately, unfortunately, we were the same age in 1995, but at that time we opened a peer training program to help people get jobs who had been um, in hospitals and, and, and been homeless. And we started building housing. And the housing we built very much reflected what I found in 1979, which were apartment buildings with families and children and former patients living together and having leases and being um, a community. So um, that actually became the standard model for the, uh, the state of New York. Um, they stopped building segregated homeless only housing and, and have integrated all of their programs now so that people coming out of shelters um, who have been uh, homeless or, or you know, patients are now moving into apartments where there's other people in the building who um, you know, have kids and stuff. Um, we opened the, age, the city's first peer-run uh, crisis center, which was an alternative to going to a hospital um, in, in, in 2013 and began uh, outreach programs um, also um, in 2017. And I retired, so now I'm doing this. Next slide. So the program really built around a, a vision statement and values. And, and one of the things when Howie started working for us, when you have a meeting 
and there's like one peer at the table, you'll have a certain kind of discussion. If you have a meeting and there's like most of the people at the table have our peers, you have a completely different kind of discussion. So this idea of having 51 peer, peer percent peer staff, you know, grew out of that um, recognition that um, to give people a voice, they have to feel comfortable um, in, in sharing their thoughts. Um, and we've also had an advocacy program that's part of our, our work for since the beginning. And so we're always working and collaborating with other organizations and bringing, um, working on social policy solutions that are beyond just the work we're doing at Community Access. Um, so our models are integrated. We have all of our housing now that we've built um, has a mix of families and, and single people on a 50-50 basis. Much like the, the housing first model, we're not getting people ready for housing. Once they move in, then we, we work with people. Um, and it's called a, a harm reduction, uh, trauma-informed care. There's a lot of uh, uh, names for it. Um, to the greatest extent possible, we have apartments that we rent in the community as, as well as uh, new construction that we do um, so that we give people some, some sort of choice. One of the things we started is pet access. It's amazing, somebody gets a cat or a dog, it's very transformative and it can only happen if you have a place to live and having that connection to a, another living thing has been very powerful. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. So our housing is beautiful um, and we design it to be something that we're any, where it's desirable for anybody to live in um, and we take care of it. So not only is it, um, you know, it looks great on the first day, um, it, we maintain it um, throughout the life. We have uh, professional um, landscapers that come in, take care of the yards, live in supers. There's 24 hour front desk in all the buildings. Um, so they're safe and they're clean. Um, in addition, again, once you have people in housing, you can start doing all kinds of things. Um, uh, activities, we bought bikes, and now there's bike share programs, but we also bought bikes uh, to have uh, uh, you know, exercise for people. We're putting in gardens and um, uh, nutrition programs, um, exercise programs. So all these things become uh, viable once you have um, uh, stable housing. So we call this the social determinants of health. So housing is a key, your health, uh, urban farms, engaging with people. We're social animals, so creating opportunities for people to get together. Um, again, and we feed off of what people want to do, and people tell us about things that they'd be interested in, and we put those activities um, together. So these are, you see some of the other things that we sponsor, also mental health film festival and so forth. Uh, back to the culture, so we were founded by people, and there were peers on the initial board of directors, um, so we've maintained that as well as the staff um, and our affirmative hiring policy, integrating the housing. And we've focused very much on our strategic planning and an active board of directors and focus on the results for the organization. We've done very well in competitions around um, nonprofit excellence. Next. So I'm going to turn this over to my friend Rokas Lupik, and he's going to talk about a, an amazing program in Lisbon. Take it away, Rokas. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit overwhelmed because I've been, while you were talking, been writing down what uh, what Housing First uh, brought me in my life. And uh, I, I've i written about like three or four pages. So I won't only talk about Lisboa, but also about what Housing First does uh, for people. And in the end, I will come back to what I've experienced in, in Lisboa. I'm, I'm quite a lucky guy because uh, on uh, about 12 years ago, I started to take peers, professionals and policymakers, mostly from the Netherlands to lots of countries in the world. Um, I've worked for, for Housing First in New York in 2004 for four months. And there I met this amazing guy, John Sullivan and Sam Sambaris and all these wonderful people who who taught me what Housing First really is. And to be very honest, it turned my life upside down. It totally changed my life forever. And I never cured from it. Um, 
what what you experience. Um, I've, I've been to housing first teams in Finland, in Norway, in Portugal, Washington, New York, Philadelphia, Burlington, Amsterdam, The Hague, uh, a lot of places in the world. And and what 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 is very typical for for people who work uh, for housing first companies or housing first teams is it has this uh, Woodstock feel about them. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I was too young for Woodstock. Uh, my brother is four years older and he was really into it. And I was, I envied him uh, because I, 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 from the side, I, I, I saw what was going on there in Woodstock. And, and later on, uh, I was very sorry I missed it because this was like the free world, right? And, and this is what I, I experience in, in housing first teams too. Uh, the percentage of people who wear tattoos, earrings, nose rings, beards, funny clothes is very high. These people who work with housing first teams, uh, they have, they are free spirits. They, they want the best for every person they work with in their life, for every homeless person they meet out while doing their work or in their free time. And, um, and this is what you experience anywhere in the world, in every housing first team I visited. These are spe people who have a special mission, who have a special philosophy about what it, what it takes to, to live a life that suits you. Uh, and, uh, and they want to provide that to every homeless person they meet out on the streets. And um, when, when I, uh, I, I traveled to, to Lisboa, to Lisbon in Portugal, uh, I felt the same thing too. There is this uh, uh, professor, Jose uh, Ornelas, who, well, if you see him speak, this man moves around. He can't sit still. He's the most inspiring speaker I ever saw talking on Housing First next to Sam Samberis. And, um, and he can steal your heart like in, in five minutes. I've been there about uh, uh, four to five times uh, with groups from the Netherlands and Norway. And uh, the last time uh, I was there was last year in 2019. And, um, and, and th this is also why, why I'm such a lucky guy because I go back to these countries every three or six months and you see things change. And the last time I was there, I was totally flabbergasted about the system they developed in, in Lisboa uh, the, because uh, from a high level, uh, from local government and government, they decided that organizations should work together. Uh, there's no way we can address homelessness as a single organization. Uh, we're in this together, like with COVID-19. We, you know, we, we have to solve this problem together. And uh, in, in, in Lisbon, you, you can see proof of that. And uh, uh, a very, the, the way they embody this proof of that is that they have this building in the city, it's near the harbor, where um, um, all the institutes, organizations, team that, that uh, work in, in Lisboa, uh, they pointed out two workers of every organization and they stacked them into this building. So whenever you're homeless and you're in need of help, you can go to this building and they will be able to help you uh, on several uh, life fields in just a couple of hours so there are no thresholds like that is what housing first should be right i visited a lot of housing first teams in the world and they all work different uh, uh, but the best teams uh, that i saw they have no threshold at all you will get your home you will get your services no matter what there's nobody going to point out if you're housing ready or not. And that differs from, from city to city. Uh, in Lisboa, there is no way they will refuse to give you a home if you have been homeless for a lot of years, if you have a lot of complex needs. And, and the beautiful part is this, there's this one building, there's this one counter, and there's this one team who's there for 24 seven, and they will address every need you have and they will try to solve it in, in just a couple of hours or, or a day. Um, a lot of people, groups that I uh, take to, to these housing first teams, they state that 
loneliness is uh, is probably the biggest challenge that that people uh, go through once you you house them. And I love the way Jose, the man in the picture, uh, this beautiful speaker, addresses this because he says there is no such thing as homeless uh, as loneliness. There is a lack of community. And so what these teams in, in, in Lisboa do is once they house a person, is they go into the neighborhoods and work actively on creating a network for their participants. Uh, so they go to supermarkets, they go to restaurants, they go to bars and try to provide people with jobs. They try to provoke people in the neighborhoods to help out these new tenants who, who come in to live in their neighborhood. And, um, and that is uh, uh, a big part of their work. So, you know, it's, it's community building is the answer. And like Jose said, diversity is the answer because, um, you know, we, we, we are in this together. Uh, when you walk through big cities in the world, um, uh, like, uh, for instance, New York, I don't know how many people from different countries live in this city, but there must be hundreds of hundreds of different cultures. And it's the same in every big city in the world. So why we discriminate or stigmatize people, I don't know, because we're in this together. Um, so um, hearing all these people speak in Lisboa, there was one very special thing too. Uh, we met people from local government. We met a person, a professor who started the total different approach approach on drug dependency you can uh, hear jose speaking and and these are all professionals uh, but the fact is that when i with every presentation i closed my eyes for a couple of minutes and it was like i was listening to philosophers they all have this same view on on basic human rights, what people need. And, and that is what I love about America too. They try to filter out stigmatizing words that people use in psychiatry or drug dependency programs because everything a person in this world is entitled to have is written out in, 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 in the Declaration of Human Rights. And, and it's a very clever thing to do because we're in this together and, and Housing First uh, is a program that provides people's needs on, on different uh, levels of, of living. Um, so maybe I can close off uh, my story with, um, with, with a, a beautiful story from Amsterdam. Hey, Ruben. Uh, yeah. This is, we are running so tight on time. And okay. Elena, we, we are so grateful that you could join us, but uh, many folks really wanted to hear about the connection between the current pandemic and homelessness. So mm -hmm. uh, I know Julie has been, Julia has really been working at that. So um, can, if we can talk a little bit about, about that, um, that would be fantastic because so many of our members are really struggling with that in their own cities. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Netherlands, uh, I've been reaching out to a lot of uh, workers in teams and uh, people are very creative. They find ways to not stay at home and still go to homes uh, uh, and, and try to connect to people. You know, it's because of this pandemic, it doesn't mean that, uh, that as a worker, you stay home. You can go out there and within uh, uh, a safe social distance. You can talk to to uh, clients. You know, it's it's not a big deal. Uh, of course, there's a risk, but there's also a risk by going to a supermarket. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you know, uh, you can you can still uh, go out there and and speak to people, uh, make an appointment on the beach and and and, and walk and talk. <laughs> Julia, what have you been finding in the New York area? So. Uh, five weeks ago, I presented a, a, you know, a plan for our county to look at and uh, thinking ahead of uh, what we were going to need to do. I think the, the initial intention I think people have who work in shelter is get more people in shelter, right? Get people off the street, which is the correct response. You want people off the street, they're the most vulnerable. But by kind of piling them in together was, is a very bad approach. So whereas in the winter, we think sit up shelter, right? Increase like, so we go from 90 to 120 in the winter. 
my instinct was you want to reduce it. You want to reduce the amount of people in shelter so that you can do social distancing within your own uh, program. So for us, uh, we've, we've de-intensified our shelter by 75%. We've actually put people into motels. We're providing services in, to them in the motels. Um, and the people we kept behind were the most really fragile people that need staffing and people there uh, more hours of the day. Um, in addition, you have to increase your cleaning. You have to, I know uh, I was hearing about, um, Elena was talking about with the bathrooms. You need to increase your sanitization even more uh, for people. Um, and then we did shelter in place, which is we had people really not leave the facility, um, which has worked. We've had zero infections. However, the whole thing that Rokas was just talking about is so important because we were socially isolating them within our own facility and people couldn't really talk with each other as much. And that was really hard. So we had to think about like new ways of, like we had music therapy. Well, we don't do that kind of thing in shelter. That's not really something you should do in shelter. But in the middle of a pandemic, how are you keeping people um, able to stay in the shelter when they, they're bored, they don't have much they can do? They can't even play a board game because they have to touch the pieces. It, it's, it was just very, very challenging. So for us, um, our idea was not burden the hospitals, not burden law enforcement really shelter in place and most importantly not stop housing people even though you're in the middle of a pandemic which i have to tell you is incredibly challenging but also if you carpe diem the moment there's a lot of landlords who actually need people to fill their apartments so if you can kind of do new ideas and do it through zoom and as rokas was talking about you can still talk with your clients and meet with your clients and social distance we were saying to people, instead of looking at apartments, we're gonna show you pictures of the apartment or a video of the apartment, because we really can't have you going and looking at three, four, five apartments. So it's a whole new way of looking at doing this work. But what, I, what we've learned is, number one, it's easier if you've ended chronic homelessness because you don't have to worry about people on your street. For those big cities like New York City and San Francisco and other places like that and Seattle, you have very complex responses that they're doing, which are incredible. Um, but I think we're a really good example of, you can actually ma manage a pandemic if you don't have to worry about all of these other people on the street that you now suddenly have to bring inside who are not used to being inside and then not providing services to, the to them in the way that you normally would do. And I think um, the last thing I would wanna say is that the biggest danger for to our clients right now are the staff because, the, and I have to tell you, so I have a lot more thoughts in the last 24 hours that I've had in the past several weeks um, because your shelter workers tend to work multiple jobs. Um, they're gonna not necessarily tell you that they're not feeling well because they need to work. And when they come into the environment and you've got people sitting in shelter that are kind of sitting ducks, um, you have to be really careful. So we have our nurse, you know, scanning temperatures and asking every shift, how are you feeling? Have you had this X, Y, Z? Um, and you have to rely on the honesty of your staff. So the whole design is challenging, um, but I think if you can put some of these things in place, um, you know, you can get through it, um, but you have to move very quickly. So. Carol, what are you finding in Miami with the, with the pandemic? I know that um, Florida, there's been some criticism that you're not you know, closing things down as the way other states have been, but what are you finding in terms of the pandemic, which is a public health crisis, and homelessness, which is another type of public health crisis? So we've been working very closely with our continuum of care, um, with our homeless trust, and um, to help those that are chronically homeless on the streets, we, the homeless trust actually entering into partnerships with several different hotels and motels and buying rooms so kind of like what Julia was referring to, not having everybody in shelter because we are trying to you know, do the social distancing is placing some of these individuals in this various um, hotel slash motel rooms. Where then um, we have what's called the PATH team. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with PATH. Um, it's a federally funded program to assist individuals through outreach case management for those that are chronically homeless and have a serious health condition. We're deploying those teams into these hotels to be able to provide 
services and maybe some activities for these individuals um, to make sure that they are practicing social distancing. If they are sick, then we are able to provide some, you know, healthcare services for them there. Um, one of our biggest issues is we do manage um, 11 residential treatment programs. And because they're all being very careful as to who, you know, any new admissions, because you have the potential of bringing somebody in who may be asymptomatic or, um, you know, you just don't know. And then you, you have the potential of contaminating an entire facility. So we're also looking at maybe using this facility, this hotel is that we're going to get, um, while we test somebody, make sure that they're, you know, that the test comes back negative, that they're not exhibiting symptoms before we kind of move them into a residential treatment program. So we're trying to get as creative as possible um, while we manage this. Um, I can tell you that, you know, most of the businesses are now closed, um, the beaches and things like that. I, I know that, you know, spring break was a huge issue um, and I, I, I see it every year and I, I was in shock when I, I saw that it was still happening. But as of now, everything is, you know, kind of closed and everybody's um, hunkered down. So we're, we're working on it as best as possible. Rukas, what are you finding in the Netherlands? I mean, the Nether, I was just checking the stats. Netherlands, Spain, of course, Portugal have been hit really hard with COVID um, and you have a homeless population issue. So how, what has that, you talked before about maintaining connections and the support services, but what are you finding in terms of um, infection, infection rates amongst the homeless? Um, are they getting tested? Is there any type of support service um, during this pandemic that you're seeing above and beyond uh, what you all normally do? I have no answer to your question. I'm sorry. Uh, I know that, uh, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends work in Amsterdam with the Salvation Army and uh, they're doing amazing work. They're uh, like putting people in hotel rooms. Uh, they're creating places where uh, they can uh, like give shelter to homeless individuals. I have no uh, uh, stats on, on infections or I, I'm sorry about that. No. I should have known, then I could have checked it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just evolving. So I just yeah. want to say, uh, Rokas talking about the Living Museum, that he, he does have a place for people to go, which yeah. I think is valuable. It is, uh, it's, a, it's an outsider art program where about 40 people uh, work. And uh, of course I closed it right away four weeks ago. But um, about two weeks ago, I thought um, my, my, you know, my ideas changed. So I wrote a letter to the mayor uh, of this community and uh, he allowed me to reopen it again because I know on the long term, people will develop a lot of uh, 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 severe problems. So uh, I'm very happy that it's open again today. About 10 out of the 40 people came. I'm allowed to make 15 people per day come in. And I'm sure that uh, in the long term, we, we, we uh, prevent people from uh, you know, depression or uh, other severe psychiatric symptoms. So I, I'm very happy. And I think uh, it is possible to, to do it uh, if you, because I've written a whole protocol on how people should behave in the building. They know, you know, people are not stupid. They know, uh, they, they read the news, they see the newspapers. So they live up to that. And, and, and then it's possible to, to uh, adapt to this new situation will be with us, which will be with us for another year, I think, you know. It's a oh, new world. <laughs> I think the concern in a place like New York City is that we're trying to keep people everybody off the streets and everybody off transit because that's those are the really the real danger points so steve i was going to ask you we had a conversation last week in a webinar um about like the street outreach teams and um what is happening in new york i mean a lot of these are still in operation tell us a little bit more about that well the um I mean, the shelters are a horrible place in New York uh, for all the reasons Julia just described. There's people that are sleeping, uh, you know, a foot or two apart from each other. Many stories in the paper today about how the contagion can, can spread. So 
our outreach teams are actually working with people in the shelter system. People are like moving out and like rather stay outside. So then you, how do you, you know, support people who've made that decision? Um, some cities are, you know, New Orleans, I just saw the other day, are moving people off the streets into, into motel rooms. They're doing it in LA. Um, it really, which really goes to show you, and, and uh, Julia mentioned it, um, there's not necessarily some sort of quality that a person who's living outside can't live inside. And this shows that you can do that very quickly when you need to. So how do we, and as Roka said, this is gonna be around for a while, moving people into indoors and then supporting people. And then, um, and that was the housing for years at, in New York were old hotel rooms. So we're really kind of reinventing maybe in a better way, a model where you can move people indoors, um, convert the motels into types of supportive housing um, and give people, you know, rights as tenants and so forth. Um, if you're not going to develop the housing that's needed, and certainly in California, they're not building anything for anybody. Um, this might be a, uh, a step towards a solution. Yeah. Well, we um, uh, final comments from everyone. We've gone about 10 minutes over. Um, I want to respect um, the participants time. Does anyone have any final um, comment or two um, I, before, uh, before we sign off? I, I would just say that um, in regards to the, the COVID pandemic is that um, there's no playbook for this. There's, there's no place any of us could have gone and said, or what do we do? So we're learning. And what I find is we're adapting and readapting every single day. But the lessons that come out of here, like Steve was just talking about, we have all these people in motels all over the, the United States, which is great. We're keeping them in business, which is great. But we can't return these people back to the street. I mean, I can't see anybody in good ethics look at that as a plan. I know for me, I want to house everybody in those motels and then repopulate in a different way for the people that are experiencing temporary homelessness, which is the way shelter is supposed to be, rare, brief, and non-recurring. And we need to go back to that, not where shelters become housing. So I just want to end on, on that thought. That's a fantastic. Uh, Elena? Oh, um, I mean, uh, I think this is going to be an issue for all of us, how we what, what is the, our life and our work gonna look like once we come out of whether it's shelter in place or stay at home orders or quarantine, whatever we wanna call it. Um, and it's a big question for all of us in public space for sure. Like how do we actually keep engaging and being together and being actually social while keeping physical distance? So um, I think the thoughts on how these things reopen and what that looks like for people who may be experiencing homelessness, but also for everybody else is going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, Carol, Steve, Rukas, any final thoughts? Maybe uh, one, one thing is uh, I, I gave Steve a book tip from a guy from the Netherlands. His name is Rutger Brechman, and uh, he wrote it two beautiful books. Uh, the last one is called Most People Are Okay. I don't think uh, uh, it's been translated yet in, in English, but his first book is, and it's on basic income. And uh, I, I saw in the news that Spain is considering on uh, transforming their, their system into a basic income for every uh, inhabitant of that country. I'm a strong believer of that. Uh, you know, provide people with a basic income, especially in these times. Uh, and uh, I think w we could um, prevent people from going through a lot of misery by doing that. All right, Steve, any final thoughts? I just want to uh, pick up on Julia said about the, what a shelter is. And their, their building was designed for this. It was designed so that people could be, it's a safe place to be. And, the, and building shelters where you're just jamming uh, uh, hundreds of people in, into a building is not, doesn't allow for all of the, the fantastic work that she's doing in terms of being able to move quickly, move people quickly into housing. Um, so this could be a, a way, if you're gonna do this stuff, um, do it right. Mm -hmm. Carol? Julia's, place, Julia's place is the miniature version of Lisboa. I loved it. <laughs> it's incredible that I was there in February, right? <laughs> Carol, yeah. final thoughts? 
Um, I, I think I tend to, you know, agree with what everybody said. Um, navigating this um, is new for all of us. We don't have the playbook. Um, we're not exactly sure what it is. We're kind of building the plane as we're flying it, as it comes to, you know, how we're responding to this. And it becomes extra difficult when you're dealing with individuals that have a, a severe and persistent mental illness that don't necessarily understand that you need to take certain precautions. And that um, obviously makes this um, that much more difficult and um, we have to continue to get creative and see how we can keep everybody safe. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. All of the work that you're doing is so important and inspiring. And I think as new urbanists, we've just kind of touched the surface. You all talked a lot about policy. I would have loved to have another hour to talk about the design of public space um, and some of the emerging solutions that are coming up because I think it's a really exciting area. Um, for everyone who is um, still with us, please thank you for joining us for the third edition. Um, join us next week um, where we talk about the lessons from the recession. We'll be hearing from Joe Minicozzi, Mary Madden, and Kevin Klinkenberg. And as a final reminder, the recording for this week's webinar will be posted on our website within 24 hours, as well as a copy of um, the presentation that you saw today. So everyone, thank you again. Um, we're all in this together. So, and everyone, please continue to be safe. So I'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.